repent because the coming of the kingdom is at hand. Uh, this is the beginning of the church year, uh, the beginning of Advent, which will be next week. And we at St. Mark's will celebrate that as we normally do. I'm here among some greenery that um, uh, this greenery was supposed to be going to the church to help with the Advent wreaths. Anel Sherritt had asked me to bring this. I'm glad to do it. I've done this uh, other years. This is on the first tree in my backyard. I take no credit for this greenery. Anel says it's the best greenery around. But um, we're going to, uh, I really want to praise Anel Sherritt and the uh, Flower Guild. They do an outstanding job, and St. Mark's is very blessed to have them. Now, unfortunately, we'll not be able to make wreaths this year. I understand there's a supply problem. Imagine that with Oasis. So uh, it's not just computer chips, but even uh, Advent wreaths are going to suffer uh, this year. But um, we're not going to do that, but I want to have our, uh, our lesson today about Advent. Now, every year we begin the uh, Christian Christmas year with Advent, and we talk about repenting because the kingdom of God is at hand. And this goes back to the Bible. The uh, A good trivia question, and maybe for another day we can discuss this, uh, is what were the first words said by Jesus in the Bible? Well, in uh, the first preaching words that Jesus says came in Mark, the first gospel written uh, in Mark, the first chapter and 15th verse, Jesus says, first thing he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God comes near. Repent and believe in the good news. Well, similarly, uh, John the Baptist in Matthew, he uses almost the same words because John the Baptist in the third chapter says, Repent, for the kingdom of God comes near. Now, we all know what the word repent means. It's you know, to be sorry, to be contrite, to uh, regret about past actions and be disposed to, to change and make our lives better when we repent. And uh, so that's really what we've said in that. Well, um, so this year, let's repent. But there's one thing wrong with that. Uh, remember, the Bible was not written in English. It was written, uh, was spoken in Aramaic, then written first time in what they call common Greek at the time. And the word that they used for repent does not mean repent. The word, the Greek word that they used in both these verses is metanoia, M-E-T-A-N-O-I-A. -E and you can certainly look this up. It does not mean to repent, to be uh, sorry, to be contrite, to change our ways. What it means is, in Greek, is to think differently, to change your mind, to change the way you think. So what Jesus and John the Baptist are calling people to do at that time is to change the way they think because the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, why would Jesus say this? Well, let's recall, and we all know this, that uh, in Jesus' time, the, uh, where Jesus lived in Palestine around Jerusalem was occupied by the Romans. And uh, the Jews were oppressed. And there were many people who were looking for a Messiah to come in to overthrow the oppressors. And Jesus was not the only one who was uh, considered a, a potential Messiah. There were many others. And they all saw, saw the same end result, that they and all their followers were killed or dispersed by the Romans. And they didn't want anything to do with that. And uh, But they, the crowd very much wanted a Messiah to come and be, uh, be the new king. In fact, in the Gospel of John in the sixth chapter, it refers to this. It says that Jesus, uh, after feeding the 5,000 uh, uh, earlier in that chapter, uh, Jesus and the crowd was very much for Jesus and praising Jesus. Jesus, you know, Jesus realized that they were about to take him by force and make him king. So he withdrew by himself uh, up to the mountains. Now imagine that, the crowd taking Jesus by force and making him king. That sounds unbelievable. How much differently would Christianity be today had that happened? And uh, basically that, you know, it, it sounds far-fetched. Imagine just a couple of years later, maybe only a year later, a, a crowd, a mob, basically forced a Pontius Pilate. Now imagine how uh, powerful Pontius Pilate was but a crowd forced him to make a decision he did not want to make by uh, causing such struggle. So it's not unthinkable. In fact, that did happen about 40 years later after Jesus, when the uh, Romans got tired of the insurgencies around uh, uh, Jerusalem and by the Jews, and they came in and took over Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 70 AD and killed many, many Jews and dispersed many others. So Jesus came... Um, you know, with a different message other than to fight and, and hate the enemies, he came wanting people to change uh, the way they think, to think differently. So Jesus' message was to, you know, to stop thinking about killing and resisting oppressors. He says, change your minds. And Jesus said, to love or bless those that hate you and persecute you. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Jesus said, instructed people to go the extra mile when they were made to carry, you know, uh, uh, 
the, the belongings of a Roman or whatever, and instead of one that takes your cloak, uh, takes your coat, give them your cloak also. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers and blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. So it wasn't just Jesus, but John the Baptist, um, when his followers in um, the third chapter of Luke, his followers you know, were listening to him. They said, well, what should we do to bring about this kingdom? And John says in the third chapter of Luke, he says, those of you with two coats um, should give um, one to somebody who does not have a coat. Those with you with food, do likewise. Share your food with people who are without. And John even speaks to um, two groups, the tax collectors and the soldiers. He says, the tax collectors said, Co collect no more than what is prescribed. And to the soldiers, he tells them, do not uh, extort money by um, threats or false accusations and be satisfied with your pay. Now, most people think the soldiers were all Romans, but actually a lot of Jews and other people, other oppressed people joined the um, Roman army as a way to make a living in those days. And, and it's interesting that John was, as did Jesus, was speaking to uh, soldiers and tax collectors who were much despised by the Jews. Now, the words I just said from the third chapter of Luke, a lot of people, if, uh, a minister said that today, people would say they were communistic. You know, those of you who have two coats, share it with someone who doesn't. But that is what John said. That was his message of a different way of thinking. So Jesus and John the Baptist, and be careful here, they just don't want people to be nice. You know, now a good question for to consider, and I've asked this question in our Sunday school class of people, and, and most people miss it. You ask, what was Jesus' ministry all about? And most people answer, Jesus' ministry was about love. No, it was not. Jesus' ministry was about the kingdom of God and bringing about the kingdom of God. And that was also the situation with John the Baptist. Bringing about the kingdom of God was Jesus' top priority. So, uh, you know, Jesus, unfortunately, Jesus uh, never clearly states what the kingdom of God is. Now, I'm not sure that actually is unfortunate because maybe that causes us to think and build it more. And this is strange that half the time Jesus, you know, talked about the kingdom as being here and now, being present. The kingdom of God is within you now. And then half the time in the Gospels, it's strange, it's almost equal, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God being in the future. So I think the kingdom of God is both. It's now and in the future. We have to pass our hands about that. So the message of Advent should not be to repent, as we've often said in the past. Although repenting, and I understand me, repenting would be an excellent idea, especially for a sinful person like myself. I need to repent and be sorry and to change my actions from what I've done in the past. But Jesus and John the Baptist are calling us to change the way we think so that we can be part of the kingdom now and the kingdom in the future. So how do we prepare for this coming to God? Not by repenting, but by changing the way we think. So um, now, you know, we all know about how we celebrate Advent. And again, I want to uh, thank uh, Nell, Sarah, and the Flower uh, Guild for all they do to help us get Advent wreaths, but we prepare by making wreaths and having Advent candles and the um, you know, lighting the candles at the beginning of the service. And also uh, some people have Advent calendars and that. Well, it's strange, this is sort of new to Christianity. In fact, Advent wreaths didn't come around to um, uh, be part of the Christian tradition to like the mid 1800s and with the Lutherans in uh, Germany brought this back. In fact, specifically there was an, um, um, a, a Lutheran minister in Germany named Johann Heinrich Wickern. I'm probably mispronouncing that. But in 1839, he had this idea. He was the minister over a, not just a church, but also a mission that took care of orphans. And the children were always asking him, now when's it going to be Christmas? When is Christmas coming like children do today. So he created the first Advent wreath so the children could keep up with how many weeks uh, there were until Christmas. And that's how that tradition started. Now before that, particularly in the, in the medieval times, uh, Advent, or well, the word's been around for since the sixth century, but it was used as a time for fasting. And fasting not for the coming of Christ, but fasting for the second coming of Christ. And this is still the truth in the Eastern Orthodox Church. They fast, they call it the, uh, the fast of the nativity, getting ready for the second coming. Now, we Episcopalians are not comfortable talking about the second coming. That's, that's more of a Baptist-like thing. Although in Rite 2, you know, we say in the, um, every week, uh, uh, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Now, when I was growing up, I lived in a place and a culture where the second coming was taken quite literally, and people were always talking about the second coming. I myself uh, you know, had that idea. I remember in the, when uh, after the 1967 
uh, war between Israel and the Arab countries, you know, and Israel took over a lot of the territories, we were pretty well convinced that the second coming was right around the corner. And I can remember that time, you know, sometimes in life you come across somebody who seems perfect. And there's a young lady that I, I didn't know her personally, but I was very aware of her. We went to the same high school. Was, she was about four years ahead of me, but um, her name was Bonnie Barrows. And Bonnie Barrows was, seemed perfect. She was, I believe, the valedictorian, but she was president of the student body. She was a good athlete, even though at that time they did not uh, have a athletics for girls in the, uh, in the uh, larger high schools of South Carolina. And that seems a little bit unusual today. But she was um, very articulate. And she would go around to all the churches in, um, in South Carolina and that part of the state and give this presentation using slides and, uh, and different uh, media uh, to talk about the second coming. And she was very convincing that the second coming was at hand. It was going to come very quickly. We all need to be prepared for that. Now, Bonnie Barrows did have a lot of resources to do this. Her father was Cliff Barrows who is not only Billy Graham's best friend, but also his music director and choir director. He was with Billy Graham for every one of his crusades. They got together in the 40s and worked together for over 60 years until uh, Cuff Barrows died and then Billy Graham did a few years later. But they were constantly together and that was his daughter who was, uh, who went to, I went to high school with his children. They lived that close to us. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's, I understand that it's very tempting for a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians talk about the uh, a literal return of Jesus, and they look for clues in the headlines. Even though Jesus said in Matthew 24, it says, About that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So Jesus did, says, I didn't even know, my, I don't even know myself when the second coming is going to be. Only God knows, but still people, uh, Christians are still tempted to look for um, signs of the second coming. Now, we Episcopalians think we're probably too um, sophisticated for that. Again, that's more of a Baptist thing. But I don't think we should dismiss or ignore uh, uh, apocalyptic writers because they, uh, they can show us symbols of God's lordship over not only creation, but God's lordship over history. And they can remind us that God is uh, won't, not just going to be present at our desk, but God's going to be present at the end of the world. And I think that's a lesson that we need to be reminded of. But Advent, you know, we're called to consider the second coming. Now, speaking of the second coming, I don't really take it literally, as some Christians do. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying I just look at it differently. And I could uh, give lessons, as I have in the past, and hopefully very convincingly, that you know, the second um, coming may have happened. It may have happened at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. It happens when Jesus comes to our, our hearts as individuals, which happens all the time. It also comes whenever we did the Eucharist. So uh, at least weekly, a couple of times a week when you did the Eucharist, Christ is always coming. I think that is, as a message of Advent, that Christ is always coming. Christ is about coming. You know, but... Um, now, other Christians do look for particular signs. You know, although the Bible doesn't really say that's going to be the case, they are tempted to look at that. So let me offer you this observation about different views about the second coming. Uh, I know that some people believe, uh, some, in fact, the majority of Christians, I'd say, probably believe that the world and people are so sinful that because of the sinfulness of people, that, um, that we will almost destroy the world through global warming and even the... Um, the uh, Episcopal delegate to the uh, conference on global warming that just passed, you know, predicted that global warming will bring an end to the world. You know, so that's not so far fetched. Also, racism, hatred, wars, nuclear wars, or whatever. We can easily see that the the end of the world is about near. And the only thing we'll say was that is that Jesus will come back and literally save us from this. And uh, a lot of the probably the majority of Christians believe that. Uh, now, other Christians, and I fall more in this category, believe that instead of a literal coming back of Jesus, that um, the world is evolving towards a, a union with Christ. Now, I want to urge you to uh, look up someone named uh, Telhard de Chardin, who was a French Jesuit um, uh, you know, from the last century, who wrote quite a bit about this, about this uh, spiritual coming together, this evolution towards a spirituality in which we Christians, it is our job, our duty, and our privilege to change the, um, our minds and to help prepare the way of God. That our jobs as Christians is to make God's kingdom here on earth and that to help God create his kingdom through our actions, that we are participants in the coming of the kingdom of God. So it is, um, you know, 
Uh, that's more the way that I think about we're in this spiritual evolving towards the uh, kingdom of God. But I have to confess that like, um, you know, I try to believe that, believe that I'm to be optimistic that the kingdom of God is going to come about, uh, you know, through this way. And I believe that in my heart. But I also have to confess that in my mind, when I, daily I read the new headlines in the papers about the sinfulness of people and about the, how the world is going to, I am tempted in my mind to think the more pessimistic way that, you know, that, um, you know, the sinfulness of man is going to destroy the world. I have to admit that. So this Advent, I, you know, need to be reminded, as I think all of us do, to be reminded to prepare for Jesus and to prepare for God's kingdom by changing my mind, by changing the way I'm thinking and trying to live like Christ and try to bring God's kingdom to this world through that. So this Advent, as we do every year at this time at St. Mark's, we are uh, again delighted to say that at, this is Advent and Christ is coming. Christ is coming indeed. So thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.